We're looking at chapters 4, 5, and 6 of Ezra this morning. Opposition development to the work of God and the response of the people of God. Let's read the first few verses of Ezra 4 together. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, Let us help you build, because like you, we seek our God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Ezrahaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, or Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King, as king Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and to make them afraid to go on building. They hired counselors to work against them and to frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Let's go again in the prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your word and its message to us. And as we meditate on what we've read and on what we will read, we pray that you will encourage our hearts, that we will hear your voice, that you will speak to us, and that we will know your blessing in our lives. We commend ourselves to you and ask your help in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. We read immediately as we begin this chapter about the enemies of the Lord's people, the enemies of ben Judah and Benjamin. And they're offering help. And I suppose the, the message that we have to learn from this is that we should be aware of enemies who certainly offer help. And there's something behind what they're planning to do. Something that they're planning to do that's behind their offer. We don't know what, but still, we should be careful. Where did these enemies came, come from? Where that they tell us, or they told uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua, that they worship the same God as the Jews, Jews did, that they had been sacrificing to him since the days of Ezrahaddon, king of Assyria, who deported them from where they originally came from into uh, the land of Israel. They claimed to, to worship the same God, but the question is, did they really? Or had they mixed up the worship of God with the worship of the idols around them so that they were really worshipping idols and imagined that they were worshipping the true God. Whatever was the truth there, and we're to some extent guessing, although I don't think it's fully a guess, these people were not true or full descendants of, of Abraham, but they were people of largely of, of foreign origin. They'd been in Palestine since the time that the Assyrians had deported them there from their original homelands. So Zerubbabel and Joshua declined their offer of help. And that offer of that refusal led to active opposition. They couldn't do what they wanted to do in an underhand or apparently friendly manner, and so their opposition became quite quite open. The leaders, of course, had uh, insisted that only the Jewish people, uh, the people from Judah and Benjamin principally, would, the pe would be the people who were involved in the building or the rebuilding program, in rebuilding the temple that had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, they decided that, that only those who were part of the family of God would be involved in this temple project in doing the work of God. Now, last week we happened to note that there were some people who couldn't prove their ancestry. They were still part of the community. They just couldn't be involved in the priestly work. They had to step aside and, uh, and leave those who were really 
in the family of Aaron and could prove that they belonged to the family of Aaron, leave them to do the, uh, the ministrations in the temple to offer sacrifices and, and things like that. But here were people who were not like those. They were not interested in the work of God. They were completely opposed to the true God. They were pretending that they followed him, but in reality they didn't. And so Zerubbabel and Joshua took a very strong line and said, no, it must only be those who are actually part of our, our community who are involved in the work of God. So we've got opposing opinions, haven't we? Opposing attitudes. Those who pretend to be uh, followers of God and wanted to help, and those who said, no, unless you really belong to the family of God, unless you are part of the tribe of Judah or Benjamin, you cannot help. Well, what happened? Well, the Jews who had returned to uh, Judah and Jerusalem made a certain amount of progress in building the temple, and then the building stopped. We stop and ask ourselves what was the cause of that, of the work stopping? Were the enemies who were openly opposing them, were they able to put the pressure on them and say, you stop working? Or was it an underhand sort of pressure so that the Jews lost heart and began to feel that, well, it's a struggle. Is it worthwhile going on? Now, do you ever feel like that in your Christian life? It's pretty tough. There are people who are opposed to me. There are people who want me to do this or to do that. And, and the temptation that comes is to, to give it all up and say, well, it's too hard. I'm not going to try any longer. Was that what happened to the Jews? Again, we're not told. We're left to think about it. Or were the Jews afraid that they would provoke their enemies into open conflict? if they kept on building the temple, so that if they built the temple, the, enemy, the, the enemies would get stronger and stronger and get more and more violent, and there would be some actual fighting. Or did the Jews change their priorities? And that's the possibility that I think we need to stop and think about. Because when we turn to the prophecy of Haggai, that's the, that's the charge that he brings against the Jewish people. As he looked at the temple that was in ruins, and still, you know, they started to build it, but there was no progress beyond a particular point. And the people were saying, it's not the right time to build the house of the Lord. And Haggai came to them and said, isn't it the right time to build the house of the Lord? It seems to be the right time for you to build your paneled houses, to build your high class, uh, good quality homes. Why isn't it the right time to, to build the temple of God? Have the Jews lost their priority? I think the last one's possibly the one that's the strongest, the stronger, the, the last of those reasons that I'm suggesting is the one that's the most likely. Although there are elements, aspects of the others that may well have been important to a small degree. But at any rate, we, we leave the story in chapter 4 at that point. I'm not going to read the rest of chapter 4, except to, to mention that a lot of people think that this is somewhat of a puzzle, because the chronology seems wrong. But Ezra is not writing a chronology, he's writing a history. Those who are historians will, will be aware of the fact that a historian doesn't start at year one and then cover everything in year one and then go to year two and cover everything in that and go to year three and do the same. A historian is interested in interpreting what's happened. And so in his interpretation, in which he keeps to the facts, and doesn't twist the facts or change them. In his interpretation, he'll take 
something from here to illustrate a particular point, and something from there to illustrate a point, and something perhaps from somewhere else to illustrate that a particular problem or a particular characteristic was an ongoing characteristic. He doesn't necessarily deal with 1950 and then 1951 and then 1952. Now he'll, he'll pick things out according to a theme. And that's what Ezra has done here. His theme is the opposition that people face. And he's telling us about the opposition that started when the enemies that lived around Judah and, and uh, Jerusalem said, we want to help. He's saying that opposition continued right on down, right through the reign of Xerxes and into the reign of Artaxerxes, and it kept on going. And that takes us through to the end of verse 23. And then we pick the story up again in verse 24. Now I've got a couple of frames here which I'll move over very quickly. Ezra 1, 2, 3 is more or less in right chronological order and the first few verses of chapter 4. Then, chapter, uh, f then the rest of chapter 4 comes from a later period and in chapter 5 we go back in time to when the temple was finally built. And uh, there is an order in which a chron chronological order that we can uh, find out I put the word check in there because unfortunately I still can't get at my books to check that I've got my history right uh, but uh, Ezra Ezra 4 from verse 6 through to verse 23 comes in a later period than what we're thinking of but let's come back again to the, the fact that these Jews had lost heart. Or they had at any rate stopped working. And they were saying that it wasn't the right time to build the temple. And we pick up uh, the story with a prophet named Haggai who is involved in rousing, arousing the, the people in getting them to get back to working for God. Uh, Ezra doesn't give us all the details about why the work on the temple came to a standstill. But what he does tell us, and we'll read this in a minute, is that after Haggai and Zechariah, two prophets of Israel, after they prophesied the work on the temple started again. Uh, Ezra's emphasis is on the help that God gave his people uh, and his protection from their opponents. Haggai has a different emphasis. His emphasis is on the need for God's people to put God first in their lives. So the two, the two books, the book of Haggai and the book of, uh, of Ezra, are looking at, in part, the same event. Should I say that what Haggai writes about is part of what Ezra writes about. They're looking at the same, the same event, but they're drawing different lessons, they're emphasizing different aspects of what had happened. Let's pick up the story as it is in the, in the Bible, from verse 24 of chapter 4. Thus the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia, now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Edo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel son of Shealtiel and Joshua son of Josedek set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God, Haggai and Zechariah, the prophets of God were with them, helping them. What is Haggai's message? Ezra has emphasizes the opposition that the returning exiles face. But Haggai emphasizes the Jews' wrong priorities. And uh, what we have to think here is, or realize here, 
is that if our priorities are right, fear becomes much less of a problem than it is if our priorities are wrong. To, to see what we're talking about, let's go to the prophecy of Haggai and see what Haggai said to these people. He wrote, In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. The word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty said. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber, timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? Because the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which, which remains a roof. While each of you is busy with his own house, Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew, and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the, on the fields and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine, the oil and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labour of your hands. Haggai is being blunt and straightforward. He's not pulling any punches. He's making no reference at all to the fact that the Jews were afraid of the opposition that they faced. What he does is simply look at the panelled houses that they built themselves. Now I can't give you any detail of the panelled houses. It just sounds as if they were good quality homes. They built those while they ignored God's house. Their excuse was that it wasn't the right time to rebuild the temple. We can, to some extent, imagine the way they thought. They were facing opposition. The people who lived around them hired counsellors, Ezra tells us they did, hired counsellors who were set about to frustrate their work, to discourage them, to see that the work didn't go ahead. But when they stopped working on the temple and started building their own houses, the opposition stopped. And they could build their own houses without anybody saying, what are you doing that for? What do you think you're doing? No, stop it. No, nobody did that. While they were involved in their own material improvement, the enemies around ignored them. But when it came to doing something for God, the enemies around restored, uh, the enemies around opposed them and did their utmost to frustrate the word. And so the people came back and said, it's not the right time to build the house of the Lord. The question is, uh, was it the right time? God had told them to go back. God had worked in the, in the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, and Cyrus had issued the edict for them to go back and to build the temple and to start the sacrificial system again. The problems were one of the heart. The Jews had become materialistic. Their own particular material well-being was something that was more important to them. And they said it's 
not the right time to build the Lord's house. And I think we've got to be careful of that attitude because the possibility of adopting the same line of thinking is with us still. It's still so easy to say, well, it's not the right time to do the Lord's work. It's not the time to do this. There's too much opposition if we do that. Nobody will want us to do this. And so we get on with our own, with our own lives, with our own progress, improving our own uh, status in life. And the work of God lapses because we're not as involved as we should be. What Haggai said to the Jewish people was, consider your ways. Give careful thought to what you are doing. And he wanted them then to consider two things. He wanted them to think about their poverty. He, he told them that they'd sown much and that they'd reaped little. They ate and were never full. They drank and never had enough to drink. They put their clothes on but were never warm enough. <laughs> the cold just still got through to them. And the wages that they earned went into bags with holes. There was nothing to show for all the earth. And what they needed to learn was that God had to be put first. And Haggai instructed them to build a house for the Lord because that would please God and it would glorify God. Two things that are important in our lives. That we do the things that please God. That we do the things that glorify God. And so the prophet said to the people, consider your ways. He also wanted them to realize that, that God was disciplining them. They left the house of God in ruins while they busied themselves with their own homes. And Haggai said to them, what you had, God blew it away. God had brought a drought on the land. And there was a drought, a famine in what the land produced and there was no result from all their labors. They didn't achieve anything. They worked hard and had nothing to show their efforts. So the prophet says, consider your ways. Think about what you're doing. Give careful attention to the way you are living. So Haggai preached his message. The good thing about Haggai's message is that the people responded immediately. Here was somebody who came fired up with the, with the, the glory of God fired up with the, with the call to the people to turn and serve God. And people responded. And the moment they responded, we find that Haggai changes his uh, approach, shall I say, and he began to encourage them. In Haggai chapter 2 and verses 1 to 9, uh, We read words like this. The word, of the, the word of the Lord came to Haggai, speak to Zerubbabel and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is why I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Haggai had called the people back to God, and he hadn't pulled any punches. He told them, as it really was. And when they responded to, to the word of God, he was there ready to encourage them. God was with them. God would help them. God would keep them. So we note two things that happened simultaneously. The people repented. 
And at the same time, God stirred up the hearts of the leaders of the people so that there was a change in the people. They repented. But God also worked in their lives to develop their enthusiasm, to develop their interest, to increase their zeal to work for God. I suppose we could say that it's it's hard for God to work if we've got hearts and stuff. If we're not really interested in doing the work of God, if there's no sign of any, any change in our lives, it's harder for God to work in our lives. But the moment that the people were ready to say, we'll change, we'll be different, we'll do what God wants us to do, then God worked in our hearts and developed a zeal and an enthusiasm and ability to do the work of God. And we find that the people feared the Lord and the people obeyed the Lord. Now that was Haggai's message. Ezra's picture is a little bit different. Still using the same facts, but he, he draws our attention to the other side of the, of the picture. There was strong opposition. And let's not minimise the opposition that, uh, that there is that's against us. It may be that the trouble is within our own hearts and God wants to call, God calls us to repentance and he will develop within us the ability, the desire to serve him. But at the same time, there is a strong opposition against us. Ezra emphasises that the surrounding people set out, this, out to discourage the Jews. That they aimed to make them afraid to go on with their building programme. They hired counsellors to work against them and to frustrate their plans. And they did this during the whole of the reign of Cyrus, right down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And when the, the Jews began again to, to build the temple, as they started their work again at the preaching of Haggai, then the antagonism returned. The governor of Friends, Euphrates, started asking questions and he wrote to the king. But what God did was to ensure that those who were determined to work, who were determined to obey him, would be allowed to continue their work. So we read part of the scriptures relating to that particular aspect of the rebuilding of the temple. At that time, Tatanai, governor of Trans Trans Euphrates and Shepha Bozani and their associates went to them, went to the Jews and, uh, and asked, who authorised you to rebuild this temple and restore this structure? But the eye of their God was watching over the elders of the Jews and they were not stopped until the report could go to Darius and his written reply be received. The report they sent to him read as follows, to King Darius, cordial greeting. The king should know that we went to the district of Judah, to the temple of the great God. These people are building it with large stones and placing the timbers on the walls. The work is being carried out with diligence and is making rapid progress under their direction. We questioned the elders and asked them, who authorised you to rebuild this temple and to restore this structure? This is the answer they gave us. We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. And we are rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago. However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, King Cyrus issued a decree to rebuild this house of God. Now, the request of the governor said, if it pleases the king, let a search be made in the royal archives of Babylon to see if King Cyrus did in fact issue a decree to rebuild this house of, of God in Jerusalem. Then let the king send us his decision in this manner. So King Darius then issued an order and they searched in the archives stored in the treasury of Babylon. A scroll was found in the citadel of Ekbatana in the province of Media and this was written on it. Memorandum. In the first year of King Cyrus, the king issued a decree concerning the temple of God in Jerusalem. Let the temple be rebuilt as a place to present sacrifices, and let its foundations be laid. 
It is to be 90 feet high and 90 feet wide, with three courses of large stones and one of timbers. The costs are to be paid by the royal treasury. Now then, and here's the king issuing his instructions. Now then, Tatanai, governor of Trans Euphrates, and Shetna, and I, and you, their fellow officials of that province, stay away from them. Do not interfere with the work of the Temple of God. Let the governor of the Jews and the Jewish elders rebuild the house of God on its site. Moreover, I hereby decree that you are to do for these elders of the Jews. I decree what you are to do for these elders of the Jews in the construction of this house of God. The expenses of these men are to be fully paid out of the royal treasury from the revenues of French Euphrates, so that the work will not stop. Whatever is needed, young bulls, rams, male lambs, for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, and wheat, salt, wine and oil, as requested by the priests in Jerusalem, must be given to them daily without fail, so that they may offer sacrifices pleasing to the God of heaven, and pray for the well-being of the king and his son. Ezra's picture is very clear, isn't it? The people were willing to obey God, and God blessed them. God watched over them. So that even though uh, Tadanai the governor and his chief assistant, Shema Bozonai, wanted to stop the work of God, they weren't able to go. God saw to it that they weren't able to go and say, you stop the work. Instead, they went and asked the questions. Who gave you permission? Who's doing this work? Uh, we want some details. And the Jews were able to say, Cyrus issued a, an edict. And so the governor and his associates asked the king. And the king came back with the answer. There was an edict. And you have to make sure that you can be so the people of God were not free from opposition. But when the people of God were prepared to be obedient to them, then God saw to it that that opposition was no fly. God blesses people who are prepared to obey Him fully. And so the, the temple was completed. Let's read from chapter 6 and just see the way that the work progressed. Then, because of the decree King Darius had seen, Tadanai, governor of Trans Euphrates, and Shethabos and I, and their associates, associates, carried it out with diligence. So the elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah, a descendant of Ido. They finished building the temple according to the command of the God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, kings of Persia. The temple was completed on the third day of the month Ada, in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Then the rest of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles, and then the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles, celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. For the dedication of this house of God, they offered a hundred bulls, two hundred rams, four hundred male lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, twelve male goats, one for each of the tribes of Israel. And they installed the priests in their divisions, and the Levites in their groups for the service of God at Jerusalem, according to what is written in the book of Moses. On the fourteenth day of the first month, the exiles celebrated the, the Passover. The priests and Levites had purified themselves and were all ceremonially clean. The, the Levites slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the exiles, for their brothers, for their brothers, the priests, and for themselves. So all the Israelites who had returned from the exile ate it, together with all who had separated themselves from the unclean practices of their Gentile neighbors in order to seek the Lord, the God of Israel. For seven days they celebrated with joy the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because the Lord had filled them with joy by changing the attitude of the king of Assyria, 
so that he assisted them in the work on the house of God, the God of Israel. Let's stop as we conclude and ask ourselves one or two questions. How does all this apply to you? I think we could probably fairly say that we live in an age that's even more materialist, or where society is more materialist than it was in, Jew in, in, Is in Ezra's day. That it's, it's extremely easy for us to fall into the trap of materialism and to spend all our efforts on self-improvement. Getting a better job, getting a better house, getting better this, getting something else. And saying, well, yeah, but it's so difficult to witness for God. Society doesn't want to hear it. The people around us are not interested. And so we, we spend all our time and spend all our effort on self-improvement. And in cases like that, the work of the Lord can suffer and suffer so very seriously. But the lesson that comes to us from both the books of Ezra and Agar is that obedience to God brings blessing. It brings blessing to the work of God. The work of God prospers. And it brings blessing to us. Now the opposition that we face may not decrease. The opposition the Jews faced didn't stop when they started to build the temple. Or to re when they started to uh, re continue rebuilding the temple. When Haggai prophesied to them. The opposition didn't stop. But God is able to turn events around. So that what? So that it is He who gains the glory. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we bow before you this, this morning and thank you again for your goodness to us. We thank you that we are able to read together what happened to the to the people of Israel, of Judah and Benjamin, when they set about to do your work and to obey your command. We pray that you will help us to be obedient to you, to be faithful to you, that we will not allow ourselves to become pressed into the mould of people around us, but that we will seek to serve you and honour you day by day. We ask your blessing upon us now as we go our different ways. Watch over and keep us, we pray, that we may be faithful to you and may know your blessing in our lives. And we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you.